Welcome to Committing Faith in Public, a podcast for people who want to be inspired by individuals and communities of faith, working for a more just, kind, and hospitable society. Through the stories our guests tell, we want to encourage you to commit your faith in public, too. I'm Gary Palusa Verdand, Executive Director of the Center for Religion and Public Life at Phillips Theological Seminary in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Well, it's great to be on this morning with two persons who I have known for a while, or at least known of for a while, but I would say in the last years or, or two have become friends of mine uh, with Barbara Prose and with Chris Bange. And I'd really like for each of you to introduce yourself a little bit to get started. So Barbara, why don't you go first? Thank you, Gary. So I am, my name is Barbara. As you said, Reverend Barbara Prose. I'm the Executive Minister at All Souls Unitarian Church. I'm Peoria, and I'm not originally from Tulsa, but I've lived in Tulsa now for 12 years. Originally from Maine? Actually, originally from Massachusetts. From Massachusetts, so, right. So I was thinking before today, you know, I was raised by Democrats in a Democratic family, a, a family of Democrats, and kind of haven't given up on the Democratic Party yet. So I'm still what we call in Braver Angels, a blue. A blue, right, right. Chris? Go ahead. Uh, Chris Benj, I'm the senior vice president of OSU Tulsa, the OSU Tulsa campus in uh, Greenwood. <clears throat> I have had a, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm a lifelong Oklahoman. In fact, I, I counted it up this morning. I like to do this at, for, for funsies. I've, I've been an Oklahoman for 59 years, 215 days to be. <laughs> and I could get down to the hours and seconds as well, but I didn't think that was necessary. Uh, so lifelong Oklahoma, very proud to be from Oklahoma, lifelong Tulsa as well, always lived in Tulsa. I have spent, uh, I, I come from a, a family of, uh, my dad was uh, in the trades uh, construction and uh, started his own business. So he's small, has been a small businessman. Uh, I worked in the trades for many years before uh, getting elected to office, uh, state house of representatives in 1998, and I served 12 years in the House, three years as Speaker of the House, and three years in the appropriation, as Appropriations Chair, as well as six years in the Minority Party at the time. I, I lived through the transition of Oklahoma becoming, I guess, officially, if you want to call it that, kind of blue to red, but, and I'm sure we can get more into that later, uh, but spent uh, 12 years in the House, uh, then went to work for Mayor Bartlett for a time in Tulsa after my service in the House the Tulsa Chamber for three years, and then Governor Fallon invited me to be a, her Secretary of State in 2013, and I did another stint at the Capitol for five and a half years in that role, as well as Secretary of Native American Affairs and also her Chief of Staff. So I wore several hats for Governor Fallon, and then in 2019, left the Capitol the last time to go to work for OSU, which I, I do currently today. Very good. Uh, a lifetime of public service to Oklahoma, to all of Oklahoma, and we really appreciate that. So it's the organization that has connected each of us with each other is Braver Angels, once called Better Angels, but they, they for some trademark issues, they needed to, to change it to Braver Angels. Please, uh, Barbara, why don't you start with this? Tell us a little bit about who started Braver Angels and what, what the organization is about. Yeah, um, it's three, three people, David Blankenhorn, Bill Doherty, and David Lapp, and, and I really can't speak about who they are too much, but I do recommend the Braver Angels website. You can see their, their bios. Um, Bill Doherty is a family and marriage therapist, counselor. Mm -hmm. So that's mm -hmm. significant, I think. Mm -hmm. um, I think after the election in 2016, they were so dismayed at the state of our political discourse in this country and how, how polarized we were becoming already then, that's six years mm -hmm. ago now. Mm -hmm. Uh, they were really curious if people with different political views could sit down together and have a civil conversation. They weren't sure it was possible. So they, they tried it out in Ohio right around the time of that election. And it was a great success. What they discovered is that people could listen to each other. They could hear each other. There was personal, mutual respect. And um, knowing that our democracy depends on that kind of dialogue, they they continued to host conversations and the organization has just grown since then. And for me personally in Oklahoma, it was after the 2020 election. You know, I was thinking that I think President Trump's presidency was challenging for a lot of Republicans that I know. I mean, because even if you're a Republican, his style of governance was extreme. 
And, um, you know, I talked to Republicans in Oklahoma during his presidency who were appalled, you know, at some of the things he was saying and doing and what he represented. So I think many of us, not just Democrats, were surprised. I know I was surprised in 2020 at how close the election was after four years of the Trump presidency. And that's when I felt I had to do something about it because I know that neither side has all the answers and we need each other Mm -hmm. and we need to heal our divisions for our democracy to endure. So I had heard about Braver Angels on the radio, I think. And after that election, I reached out and I said, hi, I'm in Oklahoma. How do we start doing this? And it's through that engagement that I met you, Gary, and you, Chris. So honored to be working with both of you. Yeah, same, same very much. Chris, what what drew you to involvement in, with Braver Angels? As I mentioned, I served in the in the Capitol under with Governor Fallon. And, you know, during that time, you could, you know, I got to experience uh, sort of firsthand, but but also just naturally watching what was going on around the country, the growing division uh, in our country between the between the, you know, the two sides or I would probably say there are actually four sides uh, because I think each party has its fringes that are creating the havoc, basically. And so it being concerned and I was invited uh, during, because I had titles as secretary of state, I was invited to speak to leadership groups and university classes, et cetera. I ultimately would end up talking about uh, civility just naturally out of my own observations and and the growing presence of social media also, uh, which I, I also point to as main culprit. Uh, being a problem. And, and I found myself naturally talking about it. So when I went at left the Capitol in 2019, I had kind of broadcast to folks in my network that I would like to be a part of your leadership class discussions, guest speaker, whatever. If you want somebody with a former couple of titles that, that might mean something, I would love to be a part of those conversations. Other than that, I wasn't for sure what to do with all that, except that two things happened, uh, both Kind of coincidental, I believe, a friend had had actually mentioned Braver Angels to me uh, as something I might be interested in because he kept hearing me talk about my concern uh, for the country. And then I had I read uh, coincidentally again an editorial that Barbara and uh, and Tim uh, Tardy Bono, who was the co chair at the time uh, with her, wrote that was in the Tulsa World. And, and I just, Barbara had her email address there. So I just emailed her and said, I'd like to be, I'd like to be involved. So that's, that's how I got plugged in. And, and it's, it's been an enjoyable experience so far, you know, get to be able to, to share our concerns, you know, our thoughts, our, our, our personal thoughts. I don't think that any of us have looked at this like we're giving up on our core beliefs, so to speak, but, but we are, uh, I, I look at it in my way. I look at it as trying to bring, bring my best neutral self though to the table. If that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Interesting. So Braver Angels is an organization dedicated to depolarizing the politics and culture of the U.S. It's a huge, huge task. So concretely speaking, what does Braver Angels do? And I'm thinking, why don't you describe a little bit what a Red Blue Workshop is? Because that seems to be one of the, the bread and butter programs of the organization. Yeah. Thanks, Gary. There, there are several, there are I think four core workshops and in that right after the election in 2020, I think we hosted three at All Souls and one was a red blue, one was a depolarizing within workshop, which is interesting. It's kind of understanding where our values and positions come from. And then, um, and one family and politics workshop, which was, I mean, I think that's another reason many of us are drawn to this work because we see how it's pulling apart even our families. So not just our national politics or our state politics, but our families. So um, in a red blue workshop, one of the most powerful exercises is, is what they call the fishbowl. So you take turns and all the, all that you do self in all workshops, you don't have to self identify, but in this one, you have to be ready to self identify as red or blue. And let's say all the, uh, since I'm a blue, I'll say all the blue participants take a turn inside the fishbowl and talk amongst ourselves with the reds listening and witnessing. Um, and, and not speaking. Mm-hmm. And we identify first the strengths of our position. And then we self-identify the challenges, the weaknesses, the inconsistencies, the hypocrisies in our position. And we share those with each other. And I'll tell you, when I, when I heard the Reds doing that, I, I softened. All my positions softened so much because I heard 
so much self-awareness and so much um, taking responsibility and accountability and um, humility. So it, all of a sudden, these positions that sound so polarizing and so black and white on social media, like you, you either think this way or that way, and it feels that way in politics today, that there's no middle, there's no place where we agree, all of a sudden in conversation with each other, the middle emerged, right? Mm -hmm. There was so much that we did agree on. There were so many values we had in common. And, and then it felt like from there, there could be a conversation about how do we move towards these shared values rather than just not even being able to begin the conversation because we think we're on you know opposite ends of the spectrum. It wasn't true. Yeah, yeah. Chris, I, I would think that one of the overlaps between your political life and in public service and Braver Angels approach is you don't get very far with the person you're talking with, if you don't see them as a human being, right, is that there seems to be a, a fundamental humanity which must be recognized. I don't wonder if you could comment on that a little. Yeah, I, th I think that's a good, really good question. I, I, I'll use my own ex example in history. You know, I mentioned earlier that I, speaking, made myself available to speak to uh, university classes and leadership classes, et cetera, whoever wanted to listen and discuss this subject. I had my own little title to a platform, if you will. My path to pragmatism is what I, and I've even created a little PowerPoint that I use to talk about my own experience. And that is that when I was elected in 1998, I considered myself today, looking back, a fairly partisan person at, at the time. And, and, and not that I, I don't think I ever looked at the other side necessarily as something, you know, less than human, so to speak, but but certainly just, just felt like that, that you know, that, that I, I mean, I just had my set ways and I, I strongly voiced those con and was convinced that I was, you know, right. Keep in mind that that, that was the time that, that the Oklahoma Republicans were trying to work to take over the legislature for the first time in state history. Uh, second time, actually, there was one, there was one very uh, kind of an anomaly, actually, in 1921, where the Republicans held the majority for two years, but it's always been, a, it was always a Democrat led state as it relates to the legislature and mostly the governor as well. So we're in this process of trying to gain the majority. I'm, I'm elected. I'm, I'm in the minority party in the house and, uh, served after, I want to say after maybe my first term, I, I, I realized that, you know, I could either be the person who, who wants to stand on soapboxes and make grand pronouncements and, uh, generally just partisan statements, if you will, to be to be blunt. Or I, I could be the person that really wants to dig in and understand how things work, you know, which is I took the latter. I started down this path of and I was interested in the budget of the state because I felt like, well, that's where you can most show your values is through the state mm -hmm. budget. Mm -hmm. So I began the study period of working on learning the budget. Uh, I did not know at the time that as we got close to and, and actually took the majority in the House in, 20, in 2004, that the Speaker asked me to be the chairman of the Budget Committee. And it, it was really because I, I knew more about it than anybody in the, in the House Republican Caucus at the time. Through that process, though, I had uh, learned and, and I consider to this day as mentors of Democrats who were House members that sh really showed me how you get things done, how you work together, how you get to workable solutions. I've always counted, uh, for example, one of the, maybe the, one of the more notable ones would be former Lieutenant Governor Jerry Askins, who mm -hmm. served as Lieutenant Governor for four years. She was a House member when I was, and she was chair of the Public Safety Committee on Appropriations. And I went on the committee, and I had these ideas, and I was kind of being pretty... Um, not not loud, but I mean, I was making my opinions known and and she she listened and she uh, gave me feedback and said, well, what you know, what about this? And was kind of guiding me, you know, to, you know, here's kind of where we'd like to be as a house position. And and so I really enjoyed that working with Lieutenant Governor Askins. There were others, too, along the way. Uh, former Congressman Dan Bourne, I count as, a, mm -hmm. as someone who I worked with and I really gained a, much respect and He's a person who I put in that workable solution category. And then and then probably the culmination of it was when I worked with Governor Brad Henry my last three years or my three years as Speaker of the House. When I was elected, he immediately engaged me and wanted to work with me and made that it known. And, and of course, it helped that I think he and I both had a bent on on trying to just get things done. And so, you know, we were able to manage the partisan side of 
the ledger, if you want to call it that. You never you never forget that or leave that as an elected person, but we we work together. So so I I felt like that over over time. I mean, I learned to be pragmatic and and kind of carry that uh, with me today and and want to you know to really want to encourage that approach. But but it's through that. I guess to getting back to your original thought or your kind of your question, Gary, is that is that the the humanity in all of it is just it's there. I mean, you become friends, you find your common purpose, and you work toward that. But 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 it has to be intentional. It has to be intentional because it certainly in the political world you can you can make a career politically of being a, a partisan person. I mean, you can. I mean, we know that. That's we see a fair amount of that right now. <laughs> it, it exists. Yes, it, it, it definitely does. So one of the magical things, I think Barbara's used that word before, one of the magical things about, about Braver Angels happens or is expressed in those moments where we get surprised by what we hear from those that we had categorized without really having yet known. And so there's a, you mentioned, Barbara did the fishbowl exercise of, of just listening to each other. And so I, I, I thought, well, let's, uh, let me throw out a couple of questions that are sort of the kinds of things that one would encounter if one does a, a red blue workshop. So if you could snap your fingers and those you disagree with politically could then understand something about your side that you don't think they do, what would you hope that they would understand? So from a blue side, from a red side, what do you, what would you really hope that the other side could understand that you don't think they do. I, I can go. I can go first again, Chris. Um, but before I answer, I, I want to say thank you. It's so it's just such an honor to work with Chris and all your service, public service. I, I love. That. What did you call it? Pragmatism. I mean, uh -huh. I just think that's so important that that was a choice you made to be pragmatic to try to get the work of government done. And I think that's an important message for people to hear today. And also, I think I want to say that it takes courage before we jump into this next depth. Please. It takes courage to do the work and the people who come to Braver Angels workshops, you people are being brave because there's a lot of fear. The more pol polarized we become, the more mm -hmm. fearful we mm -hmm. are to share our true opinions and positions because we're so afraid of being attacked back on both sides. So I think it's significant, Chris, what you said about the four parties that the people who are drawn to this work tend not to be on the fringes and um, they, they tend to be able to see truth on both sides and are really trying to reclaim a middle for the good of our country and our states and our city. So it does take courage. It's risky. So knowing that this is risky business and in light of the, the, the bill that our governor signed into law yesterday banning abortions in this state, I would say that I, if I could just wave my magic wand, I would hope that people who support that bill and say that they support life would understand that those of us on the other side of this issue also revere life and honor life and care about life, including the life of women and mothers who are faced with horrible difficult choices and who need um, access to comprehensive health care mm -hmm. and that it's not about disrespecting life that that's what i would i would i would open people's minds to consider that yeah. so that we could have a pragmatic conversation about how to care for women's health concerns and not a polarized disconnected unrealistic shouting Match. Once one side claims the moral high ground, uh, there's no place for anybody else to be but uh, on a lower ground. Yeah, thank you. That's that's great, Chris. How about you? Yeah, I, I, but before I comment too, I, I want to say that 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 is another probably something I've learned over the years is that there there is nuance to policy, and it's uh, and it's and it's okay because nuance is really just represents 300 million different opinions. Right. I mean, so if you want to use that analogy, that's how many roughly how many people we have in the country, 330 million, I think. So that's right. You know, nuance is a natural thing. And, and it is it is difficult when it's either the term I like to use is either this or that. Mm -hmm. It's either A or B. It's it's really there's a whole lot of in between uh, on just about every every policy that you can think of. 
I think the one that I, I would probably put out there would be the uh, border policy, that the, the conservative perspective on border policy does have a compassionate piece to it and, and probably, a, I, I think a conservative would say, a realistic view of, of it as well. Again, because it's it's not been it's not been characterized that way uh, in the in the political discussions and debate. It it is it is it is one of those wedge issues, just like abortion is. It's it's a wedge. But I but I think that I, I do. I think that uh, I would would like for blues or Democrats to to understand that. You know, I think it. I, I think we we own some of the problems of where we are, and that we're we we've struggled. I think to find you know what is what is that common ground. Mm-hmm. What is that common ground? So, so I'm not. It's not in any way a, a comment about we're not being un, under, we're not being understood. I think it is some of it. You know, we we definitely mm-hmm. have missed opportunities to try to to try to find real solutions on that subject. But I do think I think conservatives are are compassionate about the plight of uh, of migrants and want them treated well. Want want them treated humanely. But I I think they also look at it as as sort of a under an umbrella of, of, of realism and, 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 and that you need to, uh, the term I like to use is, you know, we need to manage our border. We need to manage it. And uh, that, that, can, that can mean a lot of things. So I, I, I get that. Thanks. Now, how, how about uh, if you could, uh, again, wave that magic wand, snap your fingers. Um, and this time you would like the people you agree with politically to understand something about the other side that you don't think they do. I'll, I'll start this time since I feel like Barbara's having to take the load of uh, <laughs> starting on all of them. I, I think I think I would like my fellow conservatives, if you will, to to understand that the other side wants government to work. Uh, they want government to work for the stability of our country, for the you know providing the the the, the best opportunity for our citizens. And uh, again, it gets uh, uh, caricatured in a way to tend to believe that it's um, it's a thirst that you can never quench. Uh, right. The size right. and scope of government, right? right? Bigger and bigger government tax it, it, it is, and, yeah. and 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 I and I think it would be something that I would probably even have to remind my myself of that not not necessarily all Democrats want that. I, I think that's an easy default to go to because it. And I'd, I'll probably use an example real quick too of just my experience and in, in the requests that we would get from agencies for funding. It was it was always more, and sometimes it didn't have any tie to you know something rational. It was just we need more, and so it you know it creates a little cynicism for a, a conservative minded person who mm-hmm. who was thinking well where you know it, it starts feeling like a black hole, right? For right. example, you know you provide an increase and. In, I'll use healthcare because it's an ever increasing part of the budget. We would we would provide large increases in a healthcare budget in a fiscal year, and then to hear come back next year and say, "Well, we need another hundred million or whatever." And you know, and you're just thinking, "When do you ever catch up with this?" It's a it's a little bit frustrating, but but yeah, no, I think I think that we should conservatives should be reminded that that Democrats, uh, liberals, progressives, uh, they they want government to work. Yeah, thank you, Barbara. Um, well, I, just, I want to say that I'm, I'm feeling a little bit of the magic. So thank you, Gary. <laughs> In that sense, that I heard Chris saying that, you know, na- claiming, naming that there are compassionate Republicans, which I think is really important. So that's one thing is mm-hmm. I want mm-hmm. my fellow Democrats to understand that all Republicans are not cold hearted, you know, bureaucrats or, you know, they don't Mon- all law and those- order. Law and order, big right. money. Who cares about the migrants on the border or the woman in the hospital? That, that's the, they're compassionate people, many of them, <laughs> doing what they think is best, trying to be fiscally responsible, etc. As Chris was saying, and so then, and and but I also and I heard in there a recognition that them because I own that Democrats can be very idealistic, that there are that that we can also be realists. There are Democrats who can be. Mm-hmm more realist Mm -hmm. and and meet in that middle ground to be pragmatic about what the next step can be, you know, toward this or that justice issue that a Democrat feels passionately about, for example. Mm -hmm. So that said, what would I want my fellow Democrats to know? So so one thing is that there are plenty of um, compassionate Republicans who care deeply 
about their fellow Americans and who want to listen and work together. Mm -hmm. So we, we can't be so overwhelmed by the fringe and the loudest voices and retreat from our civic duty to engage and vote and show up for meetings because that that would be the most dangerous outcome of this period in history. We do have to have faith in our fellow Americans. And this program has restored my faith in my fellow Republicans, which is why I continue to do the work. And there and there's a word, a word that um, Brave Angels uses, which is patriotic empathy, right? So when I listen to Chris speak, I have empathy for him and the difficulty of his position in the political world, in the world of business or higher education. And then again, I can see a way forward where I couldn't see a way forward before. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. One of the aspects of, of Brave, Braver Angels experience I've really appreciated is also what we're experiencing here right now in this, in this podcast, uh, which is the masks come off the, the masks of, that often are placed on us by that national polarization. And one finds that there are not only do you not like the mask somebody's put on you, but the other people who are participating in this thing don't like the mask that were have been put on them. Uh, and combined with that, there are opportunities for humility. And humility in, today, in a polarized culture, I mean, to admit that you might be wrong about something, either previously or currently, or that, you know, there's truth in what the other side is saying. Those are wonderful. I mean, they shouldn't be unusual, but given where our society is at, those are wonderful experiences that I think those of us who have participated in this Bravery Angels work have experienced. Gary, I think that's what's been valuable about, you know, our, what I would call our baby steps that we've taken as a smaller group, you know, a local chapter, if you will, is that we We've been uh, building trust among each other, and you know, and sometimes that takes a little time to do. It's 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 really been an important step, I think, in in our in our own experience as as Oklahomans. The Braver Angel chapter that's we hope is growing. It seems like it's growing. <laughs> right, right. And since we're getting towards the end of our time, let's go ahead and uh, uh, as we close. So, thinking about those who might be listening to this podcast who w would want to get involved with Braver Angels and let's say they're from Oklahoma what should they do what's what's the what's the action step they can take they can email one or both of us just as chris emailed me cuz we have a lot of work to do i mean these these workshops are very powerful workshops and we can host them in your organization, in your university, in your place of work, in your you know rotary club, um, law school, anywhere and everywhere, teachers, religious, doctors, religious congregations, religious congregations, <laughs> speaking of, yeah, yeah, yeah. Religious congregations. And there's all kinds of positions to be filled. We need hosts and organizers and moderators. Um, the organization nationally is really growing. And I think the people of Oklahoma would really benefit from this. So so email either one of us, and, and I don't know how we're sharing our email addresses, but I'm happy to share it right now if that's helpful, Gary. Um, what I can do is uh, we create a, a, a bit of a text envelope to go along with the podcast, uh, and we can put that in there. And uh, Barbara, I can use your church address, your church email Absolutely. address. And, and Chris, is this work for you also? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can use this, my university email. Very good. Mm hmm very good. And we're, we're meeting monthly right now. And we have people also in the Oklahoma City area who are involved and engaged and hosting forums. They also, Brave Angels also hosts debates on particular issues. And we haven't stepped into that territory yet, but that's something we can start doing here in Oklahoma. Right, right. And they're branching out uh, and uh, not only involving ordinary everyday citizens, but also in starting to involve more intentionally elected leaders. Uh, even at a federal level, they've done a bit of experimentation and have found a very receptive response to that. Not everybody loves the polarization. And for those who understand, yes, this works for, for primaries, but in terms of governing uh, and in terms of creating the kind of community we really want to live in, this more pragmatic, human oriented, we are all in this together. How do we, how do we live with each other? Well, is a much sounder approach. Yeah. And that, that's a great full circle. That's a great comment, um, Gary. And it reminds me that I think Bill Doherty appeared before some chamber of the Senate 
And it's a reminder of what I said at the beginning, that he's a family therapist. So right. a lot of this, and I think you people grow as individuals too when they do this work because they learn better listening skills because we don't always agree with our partners or our spouses or our children or our grandchildren. So, so learning how to disagree and respect each other and, and navigate those differences is, is part of our daily lives. And, it, and it's what we need from our politicians also. So yeah, I think there's a lot of wisdom to share. That's exciting. Barbara and Chris, thank you so much for taking some time to be on Committee Faith in Public uh, with me today. And I'm proud to and, and pleased to be working alongside each of you in this, in this work in Oklahoma, as well as across the country. Um, we want a more humane society. We want a society that reflects our better angels uh, and our stronger values that we are in this together. And I really appreciate getting to know each of you through this work. Likewise. Likewise, Gary. Thank you. Thank you. This has been Committing Faith in Public a podcast from the Center for Religion and Public Life at Phillips Theological Seminary. Copyright Phillips Theological Seminary and Gary Peluso Verdet. The views and opinions expressed during the podcast are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect official positions of Phillips Theological Seminary.